So we're so glad today to have Dr. Maya Katz speaking. Uh, I first knew of Dr. Katz when she was working on uh, her movement disorder fellowship at UCSF in, in San Francisco. And for those of you who have forgotten, a movement disorder specialist is the kind of neurologist that everyone with Parkinson's disease or any sort of movement disorder should see because they have a special training like Dr. Katz in movement disorders. And so they're well versed in knowing about the disease treatment and, and, um, and uh, both medications and non-medication uh, treatment of Parkinson's disease. And they're much more up to speed than a general neurologist would be because they see hundreds, if not thousands of patients with Parkinson's disease. So um, first knew of Dr. Katz when she was at UCSF and I feel like Stanford snagged her to come here and it's just wonderful to have her here. Yeah. Just great, great addition to our team. And uh, Dr. Katz is unusual in my mind among um, movement disorder specialists because she's very interested in an integrated approach to treating Parkinson's disease. And um, there's a concept that she'll be um, speaking about generally, which is palliative care or neuropalliative care. And um, that's why her uh, topic today is quality of life, wellness, and a neuropalliative approach to treating Parkinson's disease. So take it away, Dr. Katz. Thank you so much. Really great to have the opportunity to talk with all of you and just share this different perspective on um, uh, health, not only for those with dealing with something serious neurologically, but really just kind of a general outline of uh, revolution in healthcare that uh, was really started by the principles of palliative care and is slowly um, becoming a part of neurology and neurological care. And so I, it's called holistic health and wellness. And so we'll cover the topic of total health. What does that mean? We're gonna cover the concept of connection and also talk a little bit about communication and medical care, what, how that's important, uh, how you can best get the care that you need and the total health care that you need. And then we'll talk about specific wellness strategies. So the concept of total health really comes from the idea that we're not just biological buttons, right? We're not just dopamine, um, uh, you know, knobs to turn up and down. We're much more than that, right? We're emotional beings, we're social beings, and we're spiritual beings. And if we don't take that into account with health, then we're really shortchanging, we're shortchanging people, right? Because we're more than just our, our, our biological buttons. And so that's the idea of total health. It was created by Dr. Cicely Saunders in the 1960s. So it's a pretty old concept. Um, it's been around for about 60 years now, and it, she really was the first person to say, you know, it's not enough for us to um, treat someone's, for example, pneumonia if they have lost their connection with their purpose and meaning in life, they're not going to be healthy. And she's really the first person that made this uh, concept known, She and she was actually knighted uh, by uh, Queen Elizabeth for her work developing palliative care and this concept of total health. So it's really a revolution in, in um, modern medicine. And so what do we mean, you know, in terms of all these different aspects of health, physical health, the biological buttons, we know, as all of you know, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's are the tip of the iceberg. And for a lot of people, they deal with more non-motor symptoms than motor symptoms. And so there's you know, definitely room to improve on the treatment of the biology. And then in social health, anything serious medically is going to affect the whole family and it's going to affect the health of the individual and, and you know, how you interact. So a 
all of you could be teaching me more about how, how Parkinson's has affected you in terms of your social health. Um, but certainly there's a lot of people can feel isolation. Isolation is a big problem in Parkinson's and that in itself can lead to poor health. And so people need to stay social and stay active and stay connected and engaged. And you know, there, we know Parkinson's or anything serious is gonna change family dynamics. And so I do recommend, I have some therapists that I work with uh, who are marriage and family therapists. And I do recommend that people you know, really reach out and establish care with a trained therapist who can help guide them and help prevent some of these issues from arising. And what do I mean by spiritual health? Well, the one question that's been shown to uh, be able to assess spiritual health accurately is, are you at peace? And so that's kind of the how I would like you to see the idea of spiritual health is that overall sense of peace, uh, overall comfort with meaning and purpose in life, and connection to the greater, whatever that means to you. And people who have better spiritual health do better medically as well. Their biological buttons are easier to fix. And so it's not just an add-on, we need to make sure that the social, spiritual, emotional health is strong and needs to be addressed as much as the physical health. And planning and preparing for the future, being able to really get that guidance from your, um, from your doctor, from your clinical team, is important. And so we'll talk about how to communicate those types of, of questions. And really important total health is of course about care partner health as well. So care partners get, caregiver burnout, care partner burnout is a real medical condition. So, you know, I, I have care partners who tell me, oh, I don't need, I don't need regular breaks, I'm fine. And the truth is that even SEAL Team 6 needs to recharge. <laughs> so you know, even if you're a SEAL Team 6 care partner, we all need to recharge and we all need regular breaks, regular respite. So just talking about the idea of connection as protection. And so this is a really key concept that Dr. Cicely Saunders developed and is a key concept of palliative care. That's the idea that connection is protection. And, not, and what does that mean? It means connection to the self, what's important to you, what brings you joy and meaning in your life, connection to your family, your community, to nature and the greater. And that's what keeps us emotionally, socially and spiritually healthy, one of the major factors. And it really tackles that issue of isolation that so many people deal with. So this is a study where they actually had people showing empathy to each other. And we see that certain areas of the brain actually light up and that we are actually wired to connect. When we show empathy to each other, when we connect with each other, there's areas of the brain that were actually evolved um, to connect with each other. And so people who are having that kind of connection, they have certain brain um, metabolic patterns that are happening. So we're, we're wired to connect. It's not just something extra. So taking that into account and looking at, you know, how do you make the most out of your doctor's visits kind of with this different perspective. So the first thing you wanna do is make a plan and you can prepare for your visit by writing out a list of questions or concerns that really is key for treating the non-motor symptoms, which often are um, not assessed, not even asked about in the doctor's visit. So for example, 50% of people who have depression with Parkinson's disease are untreated. And when you look back at their most recent neurology note, the neurologist never asked them about their depression or their mood. So if it's not asked, it won't come up, it won't be treated. And so if it's, uh, something that you really want to make sure is, is discussed, you want to create, you know, just make sure to write it out as a list so that you can bring it up with your doctor. 
A part of palliative care is the idea of intensive symptom management, aggressive symptom management. And so it's not the regular kind of symptom management that you, that you get in a typical doctor's visits. We like to say that we're aggressively com comfort. We're all about aggressive comfort. And so really, you know, we're trying to change the culture of neurological practice to take on the, the idea of intensive symptom management instead of kind of address your symptoms and then I don't see you for another six months. So uh, for now, you really need to advocate for yourself to make sure those issues get addressed. And you wanna share what's important to you, your goals and values. What are you looking forward to? So for example, if there's a wedding coming up and you wanna make sure your voice is really strong, that's important to talk about with the your neurologist so that we can send you to good speech therapy. Uh, or you know, if there's questions about travel or other types of things that are your goals, uh, if you're nervous about them, you want to talk about them with your with your neurologist so that they can help you plan and make and make those goals uh, a reality, right? So we always are thinking about in the future, what are you worried about? But also on the flip side, what are you hoping for? And it's the hope that's really important and making those plans ahead. And, you know, just talking more about what are your worries? What kinds of things are frustrating to you? For some of these things, we may not have an easy solution, unfortunately. I wish we did for all of the different symptoms. We do have many treatments though that can help control many of the symptoms. And it's also just important to talk about these difficult emotions, which are so common. And we call them an adjustment reaction. And they're not depression. You know, if we, if someone has, gets difficult news, they're gonna have difficult emotions, right? So things like guilt or frustration or loneliness, loss or grief, those are difficult emotions that everyone feels when they're dealing with something serious medically. It's just a part of being human and how we process things. And it's not depression. Depression is a disease that requires a medication. And this is just normal, normal processing of difficult news. And there are ways to move through this and to develop coping strategies and resil resiliency strategies, some of which I'll talk about and I'll talk about some programs where you can help build on these skills. Uh, but it's, it's really important. The goal is not to give you enough Prozac to numb your, your normal emotions. The idea is to acknowledge the difficult emotions and help you move through them. And the big thing is when you bring it up with your doctor and you bring it up with your loved ones, you're helping move through, you're helping your, yourself move through these difficult emotions, just acknowledging them and talking about them. We wanna, when we get some difficult news, the first thing that we wanna do is retreat. And that actually is not good for us. We need to do the opposite, we need to connect. And then care partner health is often not assessed in a regular doctor's visit. Palliative care is um, critical. We know that caregivers, when they burn out, their health is severely affected. And so we need self-care for the care partner. So it's not selfish to care for yourself. If you're a care partner, it's actually selfless because then you can actually be healthy and be there for your loved one. So kind of flip it around. So I wanna to talk to you about some of the wellness strategies that I really learned from a Buddhist um, chaplain at UCSF who is a palliative care chaplain and she really focuses on helping people build coping strategies and build resiliency. So one of the main ways is through mindfulness. And mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction was created actually as a pain management tool, and it does work. Actually, you can use mindfulness to help with pain. 
but it also is really helpful to increase that calm circuit, that peace circuit. And so this is a quote from John Kabat-Zinn who developed mindfulness-based stress reduction. You can't stop the wave, but you can learn to surf. The idea of mindfulness is that you can't stop the waves of life, but you can learn to surf, surf the waves. These are some wellness, uh, these are some mindfulness uh, learning tools that I recommend. So I do recommend that uh, people get Headspace and there's a beginner series. It's 10 days, 10 short meditations, three to 10 minutes long. And um, he'll, the person who, who does Headspace will teach you how to, med how to do mindfulness. And uh, if you wanna move on, you can actually do beginner series two, which is another 10 days and beginner series three, another 10 days. So you could take the 30 day, 30 meditation, cha uh, 30 meditation challenge and really learn about uh, mindfulness, learn more about how your mind works. So I recommend that that's just an app that you can get on your phone. And I think it's, I think just personally, I think it's, it's a really great way um, a great way to learn mindfulness for the for someone in, in, in kind of a Western mind. And so he, he makes it more playful, more fun. And so I, I do recommend that. And then I recommend this book, How to Relax, which is a book by um, a Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh. And it's a very simple, short book. And it just talks about how, how do you relax, which we all think we really know how to do but how do you relax just by sitting there and being? And so he talks about that. And then it's hard to do, it's hard to do this without seeing people, um, but I do, I do uh, uh, generally ask for people to start some of these practices. So this practice is about creating a gratitude uh, a gratitude practice in your day. So it's really simple. At the end of your day, you can think about two or three things that you appreciated that day. And it should be specific to that day. So for example, let's say you have a cute dog. You can't just say, oh, my dog, my dog, my dog. It has to be something specific that day. I took my dog for a walk and what it, you know, it was really fun or something that happened that day that makes you appreciate that day. So I typically just ask people to just take a few, uh, maybe 10 or 15 seconds just to think about something that you appreciated today. Tiny successes, little things that made you happy. And it's a simple practice, but it's very powerful part of positive psychology. It really changes the brain and makes us start looking for things that it appreciates during the day. So you're looking at a glass half full rather than a glass half empty. And if you practice the gratitude every day for a couple of weeks, you'll see that your brain just automatically starts to look during the day for things that you are grateful for. So it changes the way the brain um, experiences the day, how you experience your day. So I really recommend that people find it just a general time during the day for them where they're going to always practice their, their, do their gratitude practice. So for example, over dinner with your family, you can go around and say what you appreciated. I do my gratitude practice when I'm brushing my teeth at night because I'm not really doing anything else for a few minutes. So it just reminds me to do a gratitude practice. So uh, don't, estimate, don't uh, underestimate how powerful this practice is. It's, it's um, really life-changing. And so I've just encouraged people to just start doing it today. And the other practice, and this is in a, a wellness journal that uh, we can, we'll send so that you can, you can print out or you can just take any journal where you write this down. But the idea is to have a daily intention for the day. What does that mean? It's kind of an, an odd concept. It's sort of a theme for the day. Um, so for example, my theme for the day might be calm, calmness, or it might be cheerful, 
or to smile more. It could be it could be any kind of a pro-social theme that you want to take in your day. And then when you're feeling a little stressed, you can think back to, oh, wait, the theme of my day, my intention was calm. And it just takes that little moment for you to step outside and then be able to have some choice in how you deal with the situation. And so daily intention too, setting that can be really powerful. A lot of people use the same intention for a month and then they'll switch or for a week or sometimes people will change their intentions every day. You can do it however, whatever speaks to you. And then the other part of the wellness journal is setting your goals for the week. And so we talked about total health. Well, how do we make sure that that happens? Really scheduling in activities, behavioral activation that really helps with the total health. So one, you wanna set up physical goals for the week, social goals for the week, meeting a, a lunch with friend, going to a play are the examples that are written there. Your mental, your cognitive goals for the week. So this shouldn't include doing your taxes or work. This is cognitive uh, leisure activity. So things you do for fun that are good, good for your cognition. Uh, playing bridge, learning a new language, uh, really learning something and gaining mastery and doing it every day is really beneficial for the brain. So I do encourage people to try to learn something new. Maybe there's an instrument and maybe a painting technique, something that you want to do and learn. And then you want to set up something, you want to set up specific activities for your spiritual health, whatever that means to you. Might be taking a walk on the beach or doing some yoga or going to uh, a place of worship. And so you really want to be very specific here. You don't want to just say, oh, I'm going to do yoga next week. You want to say when, what time, how long, how are you going to get there? So you really want to plan it out very specifically. You can do that on a Sunday and just plan out your week and see how you do. You can come back to it the next Sunday and say, how did I do on my goals? Did I reach my goals? Did I not? Why? Why not? Those types of things. And this really helps reduce some of the isolation as well. So this is a quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, which I just enjoy. Uh, Smiling is mouth yoga. <laughs> so a very simple thing that you can do for wellness is to smile. And it sounds maybe a little corny, like just put a smile on it. But it's actually much more than that. When you smile, you tell your brain things are good you're safe, things are going well, you actually generate a lot of positive uh, chemicals in the brain that allow you to feel better. And so Thich Nhat Hanh actually encourages people to practice mouth yoga by smiling. Uh, cognitive leisure activities. So these can be, you know, we talked about some examples and you know, learning something new. There is um, some data for pro daily crossword puzzles, uh, reducing cognitive issues as people get older, Sudoku, jigsaw puzzles, really finding something that you enjoy and will do. Super important is getting enough sleep. So sleep is sort of the garbage collection time of the brain. And so if we don't sleep well, the garbage accumulates in the brain and that becomes toxic to our brain cells. And so the goal is about seven to eight hours of sleep per night. And sleep is often disrupted in Parkinson's disease. And so you do wanna to talk to your doctor about how to get help with sleep. There's a specific cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia that works better than any of the sleep medications. So some people say, well, I don't want to take something for, you know, I don't want to take a sleep medicine. You don't have to. There's actually just uh, therapy that can help you develop uh, better sleep habits. And then, of course, diet is important. So some of the recommendations are to, that I give are to eat a Mediterranean diet. And that's been shown to be the most healthy for the brain, people who typically eat the Mediterranean diet, 
they have lower rates of dementia, and they live longer. And they actually have larger brain volumes. So it's considered uh, one of the healthier, one of the healthiest diets that you can have for brain health. What are the main things about the Mediterranean diet? Lots of whole grains, lots of beans and legumes and colorful fruits and vegetables, lots of olives and um, olive oil. You can eat fish and eggs, um, very little red meat, if any, maybe once a month is uh, allowed in the Mediterranean diet. And then I also encourage people to have organic food. That's because the pesticides that we eat every day cause Parkinson's. They're specifically toxic to the brain, to the area of the brain that causes Parkinson's. So if you already have Parkinson's, you wanna limit your exposure to those toxins and eat organic food. And then there's a lot of discussion about probiotics and what the role are, role, uh, role are uh, with probiotics. And Parkinson's, what we do know is one, we're not alone. We live with trillions of bacteria. And a lot of them are in our gut, the gut microbiome. And two, we know that the gut microbiome of people with Parkinson's is abnormal. Some of the bacteria that develop in people that accumulate in the gut of people with Parkinson's they eat dopamine and that's why they're accumulating there. So there's two bacteria that have been identified in 2019 that accumulate in the gut of people with Parkinson's and, and they eat dopamine. So they, they are causing some of the dose failures and the um, lack of kind of reliable response to cinnamon that people have. So, by replacing the gut microbiome with healthier, with healthier bacteria, uh, will or there's a clinical trial right now looking at this, but the data so far shows that it increases, likely increases your on time, and also will help with some of the digestive bloating, cramping issues that people with Parkinson's have. So this is really an evolving story, and you know, for people uh, who have questions, I can go more into it in the Q&A, uh, but it does seem to be quite important. The other, the fourth thing about the probiotics is that in animal models of Parkinson's, when their gut microbiome is uh, normalized, the, uh, the progression is slower. And so there, there might be a role of changing the gut microbiome to, uh, to delay progression of Parkinson's. Some other dietary uh, recommendations. So you want to limit fried and processed foods and simple carbohydrates. And that's because they can lead to prediabetes and diabetes. We know that people with Parkinson's have a higher rate of prediabetes and that people with prediabetes and diabetes with Parkinson's, they progress faster. And so it's really important to manage your sugar levels and to eat foods that don't increase your risk of developing diabetes or prediabetes. For the brain, prediabetes and diabetes is just as toxic. The brain does not differentiate between the two. So the Mediterranean diet, sticking to those whole grains um, and, and unprocessed foods, that's gonna be much more healthy. And caution with non-organic dairy, and that's because dairy accumulates pesticides. The cows are eating from the ground, you know, a lot of um, grass, and then it basically accumulates in their milk. And so there's very, very high rates of pesticides in dairy. And so, um, and actually even organic dairy uh, has high rates of pesticides because the non-organic farm is right next door to the uh, organic farm. And so the pesticides seep in, you know, under essentially in, under the ground into the organic farm. And so limiting dairy overall is going to be healthier for you. There's a study that was done in Hawaii where they 
looked at people who are over the age, really followed them for decades and looked at how much milk they consumed. And they were able to predict who would get Parkinson's based on how much milk they consumed over their lifetime. So it's a real risk. Limiting animal meats and fats, sticking to the um, Mediterranean diet, heart health is brain health, and then limiting alcoholic beverages. Exercise, of course, is incredibly important for your wellness. I really think of it as the number one most important part of treatment. It's more important than cinemat. People really need to have a robust exercise program. The most important thing is high intensity aerobics. High intensity aerobics is the only thing that has been shown to delay progression of Parkinson's right now. What does that mean? That's about two hours a week of high intensity aerobics. And high intensity has to do with reaching a, a, a certain heart rate goal. And so I do recommend that people with Parkinson's build up to that two hours a week of high intensity aerobics so that they can start to delay Parkinson's disease. Tai Chi is really important. It's been shown to be the best for maintaining balance and reducing falls in Parkinson's compared to physical therapy and other types of exercise. I have um, a picture of ballroom dancing, which ballroom dancing in general has been shown to um, people who ballroom dance who are over the age of 60 have a lower risk of developing um, serious memory problems. And so ballroom dancing itself, it's very, uh, it's what we call a dual task. I'll talk about that more, but it's a mental task and it's a physical task. And that together, when you do those types of dual tasks, it's, the brain is supercharged, gets a supercharged benefit. I also have a picture of boxing, rock steady boxing. I really um, encourage that for people who, who if, that, if that's an activity that you're interested in because it includes the high intensity aerobics, the stretching, the strengthening and the balance exercise that really should encompass a complete exercise program. And then there's something called forced exercise. Some of you may have heard about it. So the idea is that people with Parkinson's underestimate how fast they can go. And so if you have someone with Parkinson's on the back of a tandem bike, and let's say a physical therapist in the front of the tandem bike, the person with Parkinson's will meet the speed of the physical therapist, even though on their own, they weren't able to do that. So the idea is to force yourself to go more than what you, where, where, uh, where your brain is telling you your limit is. You can probably go faster and you can probably go longer. And when you force yourself, they also showed really tremendous benefit, both cognitively and with balance. So the idea is to kind of push yourself to go a little bit more, a little faster. The exercise needs to be challenging in order for it to be beneficial. And then a little bit about dual tasks. There's a saying you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. So that really comes from this idea that when you're doing a physical task and then you're trying to do something else mentally, you're distracted, right? So if you can learn to do those two things together, that's when we really see significant benefit. So a really simple dual task that, that uh, I read about is a, a study where they had a person with Parkinson's and then they had a, a partner, their care partner, and they would just take a walk together daily. And uh, when they took that walk, with every step, they would say a word. And the next person would say a word that starts with the last letter of the word that was just said. So for example, someone might say cat, and then the next person says table, and then the other person says elephant, you can go back and forth. And so the idea is that you're doing, you're, you're walking and thinking at the same time. And that's when we really see neuroprotection. So I would encourage you to do that. Just really simple dual task. Next time you take a walk with someone, every step, just try to say a word 
And the next person says a word that starts with the last letter of the word you just said, and just go back and forth. In the study, they showed that people had significant benefits in cognitive testing and their balance was much better. Just from that, just from the practicing dual tasks. And then there's a, a lot of programs now online where you can really stay connected. Again, the idea is connection is protection. The Stanford has a neuroscience supportive care program that has a lot of different programs, a lot of exercise programs. They have free Tai Chi um, and they have care, uh, care partner support programs, a lot of different options, a lot of different offerings to take a look at. Pediactive is a, is a support group in, in the, the East Bay and they have a number of different offerings as well. So really encourage you to stay connected, stay social um, and reduce any kind of isolation that you might be experiencing. So the key points really uh, are these three things. These, uh, uh, the first one being that the, this idea of the total health approach is, is quite revolutionary in medicine. Really, um, until Dr. Cicely Saunders started talking about the fact that we're more than just biological buttons, we didn't really understand that. In, in medicine. And still medical care, in my medical training, really was about biological buttons. We weren't really trained on how to assess and help people with the emotional, social, and spiritual distress that serious illness is going to cause. And so all of those factors need to be addressed. Palliative care itself is a very loaded word. It has a, a huge amount of stigma. People are um, they feel when people, when you say palliative care, people think, oh, you're just giving up on me. <laughs> there's, there's nothing left. And actually it's palliative care is the total opposite. It really is, uh, a type of, of specialty care that is accessible and really should be started, uh, on day one of any type of, you know, the day one that you got Parkinson's or we're diagnosed with Parkinson's, we can really bring in these concept of palliative care. And because of the stigma associated with palliative care, the P word, you know, I try to, I try to, you know, you try to describe it in other ways, but it really comes from the principles of palliative care that has, that has um, really turned medicine upside down and helped us see um, that we're, we're, we're whole beings and not just biological buttons. Connection to the self, family, community, nature, and the greater builds resilience. And what is resilience? Resilience is bouncing back. It's not how you endure with distress. It's how you learn to thrive, no matter what the situation is. Okay, well, thank you so much. And I can take questions now. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Katz. And uh, everybody would be applauding. You would hear everyone applauding if you, if we unmuted everyone, I'm quite sure. <laughs> so um, everyone, uh, you, you have a Q&A button icon in your bottom of your Zoom screen. And um, there's also a chat function. You can uh, send your question via chat as well. And on my screen, I access a chat through the more icon, M-O-R-E. And then if I click on that more icon, I see chat at the top. But so you can either use chat or Q&A and we're happy to take questions. And I had a couple questions for you, uh, Dr. Katz, as we're going along. I thought it was, uh, you know, someone uh, recently said that um, they listened to your talk on, um, uh, a total wellness, total health and wellness, and said it was uh, an unusual perspective for a, for a neurologist to have. And I completely agree with that assessment. I think it's a very unusual talk and, um, and, and a very important one. And I thought it was interesting that um, 
you uh, of course recognize the stigma associated with the P word, the palliative word, and that we often associate that with hospice, with end of life and hospice. Um, could you just say generally um, what the relationship between hospice and palliative is? So sure. as further yeah. that difference. Yeah. So I'm just going to go back to um, one of my heroes, Dr. Cicely Saunders. So you can kind of just see. So the idea, so Dr. Uh, Saunders, and she was a nurse, a social worker, and then went back to medical school. Um, and so she was the integrated care herself. <laughs> and probably why she really saw people from all these different perspectives is that she had that training herself. And so she developed uh, the first hospice. So she is the founder of hospice. And she developed palliative care principles as a way to help people at the end of life. But over the course of her career, and then now as, as we continue to um, learn from her teachings, the idea of palliative care has completely come out of, you know, withdrawn from just hospice. Hospice is a type of palliative care that people get at the end of life. But palliative care itself really is just this idea of treating people as whole people, understanding that any kind, anything serious that you're dealing with is going to affect all of these aspects of your health. And there, there's no one on earth that doesn't, where these types, these uh, specific components isn't important, right? Every single person, we need social health, we need emotional health, we need spiritual health, and we need physical health. And we just can't ignore them. And so really palliative care is just, now we just practice it as a perspective. How, how do we really, how do we acknowledge that people are going to go through adjustment reactions and how do we help them through it instead of just not talking about it? <laughs> um, and so now palliative care just means if you're, if it's really a specialty to help anyone dealing with something serious have a better quality of life. And it really should be given in my perspective on day one. Really my goal and what, what I've been doing for the last, I don't know, seven years, and continue, uh, will continue to do is teaching neurologists about this perspective and how to be uh, what we call primary palliative providers so that any neurologist you go to can do the basics, can help you um, with all of these different aspects for health. And then if you need a specialist, you get referred to a, a, a team, a palliative care team. I actually try not to name uh, we have a clinic here, for example, at Stanford that I'm starting that is neuropalliative. And um, I also refer to it as the neuro wellness clinic because we, there's actually been studies done where if you tell someone and you describe the services in the clinic and you tell them it's called palliative care, they'll, they'll say, I'm not ready. But if you describe the same services and you call it supportive care, they'll say, oh, yes, please. And the same thing happens to doctors. We have the same stigma. If you tell a doctor to recommend a certain service and call it palliative care versus supportive care, they're just much, much less likely to mention it because of the stigma. Um, and I, I think you know we can't ignore the stigma. We're cultural creatures, right? So the stigma is the stigma. And so I think just reframing it kind of for what it is, it's this total health perspective Internal med your internal medicine, your primary care doctor, palliative care has been much more integrated in, in primary care and internal medicine. And in neurology, there's still, a, I call it the palliative care chasm. <laughs> we have a chasm, but we are slowly closing it. Uh, maybe single-handedly, <laughs> you're trying to- Well, there's a small group. There's about six of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a <laughs> half a dozen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, if, if you just looking at this slide, if 
um, if I were speaking with my physician and my physician addressed all four of these boxes with me, I would feel so well taken care of, so well listened to, um, uh, nurtured in a way. And uh, so, yeah, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want all of these services? Yeah, and the idea is that it is essential. It's really essential to help. We can't just focus on the biological buttons and think that someone's going to be healthy. You know, if we, that's, that's why the data really shows, you know, for when people get deep brain stimulation, they need to get it early rather than late because really it's about being able to be active and be engaged. And that's when people really get the best benefit from DBS. Over time, if people are not feeling well and they've self-isolated and their psychosocial health is poor, even if we take away their tremor, their quality of life will not be much better, will only be a little bit better. But if we implant DBS before those issues are, are affected, the DBS itself is twice as beneficial for motor symptoms and the quality of life is through the roof better. Right. So it, it really, you know, we, we can't separate these things. And that's, that's the major principle behind it. And that's why in a palliative care clinic, it's an interdisciplinary model where there's a physician, a nurse, a social worker, and a chaplain. And so every one of them addresses these aspects and what they're focused in their training. Wonderful. And so are you setting up that kind of a supportive care clinic then at Stanford? Yes. So we're in the pilot stage right now. And so we're just open um, a few days a month and we're built, I'm building my team. So I have a nurse and I think I, I uh, may be getting a chaplain. <laughs> I think I found, I found some, some funding for that. Thank you, Dr. Bill Langston. And so, uh, who's been very supportive. And so, yes, yeah, so I'm building the team and then, and then I'm gonna open it up wide, uh, wider for a you know, larger um, patient population, uh, you know, to be able to really serve the, you know, the, as, as large of a group as we can. At UCSF, I had a successful interdisciplinary palliative clinic for about seven years. And so, really just bringing that model here. So stay tuned. I think probably in about six months or so, we're really gonna be set up. Well, that, that's pretty fast uh, in, on Stanford time or on medicine time. <laughs> so it that's is. great. Um, uh, and if anybody else has questions, please put them into the Q&A box or the chat, chat box, that would be great. And I will uh, be sharing uh, Dr. Katz's slides and um, the daily or the wellness journal that she mentioned. I'll share it on our webpage probably by Friday, along with the recording of this webinar. And, and, and then I'm wondering if you could also share the link to um, Judy Long's re uh, uh, online resiliency course. Yeah, I did already, and both oh, of the classes, are, uh, thanks to our efforts, both of the classes are already filled up. Yeah. I did that uh, a couple weeks ago, oh, and, and okay, a lot of our people got the last few spots, so oh, I, I got, it. I got, got a, it. thank yous for that, and I'll pass it yeah. on. Um, so uh, maybe just if you could describe it for the people that don't know what we're talking about, because there will be another class starting in January. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Judy Long, she teaches um, an ongoing course uh, at UCSF that really focuses on building coping and resiliency skills. So it's a six week, six to eight week course. There's a separate course for people with Parkinson's or really with dealing with anything serious. And then there's a different course for care partners. And so it's nice if you, if you have you know, a care partner, you can take the course together, you can practice the skills together. Even if you take them at different times, you can still practice the skills together because they're similar skills. And so she really focuses on grounding, building a positive mindset. And then, and she focuses on these different aspects of building wellness so that uh, 
the idea is thriving, not enduring. So that's, that's really what she teaches. And she's a specialist in that. That's what she's trained to do. And so I really encourage everyone to take that course. Wonderful. And as I said, there it's all filled up uh, now for this fall's course, but um, yes. Judy told me, uh, Chaplain Long told me that it will be uh, starting again in, in uh, January and uh, both courses now will be eight weeks, both the yes. uh, course for the caregiver and the course for uh, people with a, a serious diagnosis, uh, both courses will be eight weeks. So stay tuned for that one. As soon as I know about it, I'll, I'll email out to people on our list. Um, one of the other, oh, I thought it was kind of funny. You mentioned um, something, oh, the gratitude, the daily gratitude. Uh, you could do, you, you do it when you're brushing your teeth. So same time every day. I have several other things I do while I'm brushing my teeth. <laughs> Okay. It was been suggested many times as a, a good time to do things. So I, I stand on one leg, for yeah. example, to practice my balance. Emails, yeah, your bells. Good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I need to find a different time during the day <laughs> or the evening to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. It can be really anything. Um, even, even taking some time to do like many mindful moments. So you can make it a part of your intention. You can make the intention kind of a theme and a practice. So if you want to, for example, practice some mouth yoga and smile, then you can just sort of have triggers during the day. So for example, Chaplain Long, her trigger is going to the bathroom. When she has to pee, then she does, she's like, oh, I can also do a mindful moment. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I took a course uh, a palliative care course where the chaplain suggested that every time your phone rings, instead of like, ah, oh, you can, it'll trigger you instead. Oh, it's a mindful moment time. Yeah, that's and cool. And then get yeah. the phone. So that's kind of a different way to experience all the, you know, pings and dings and sounds and, you know, that we get throughout the day that kind of disrupt us. It can remind yeah. us to do a, mind, take a mindful moment. So, you know, even, even just finding things throughout the day that you can say, okay, I, I eat three times a day, I'm going to be sitting, I can, that can be my trigger to do something mindful. Yeah, those are great ideas. Um, let's see, and if anybody has questions, please type them into the Q&A box or the chat box, otherwise I'll just keep going. Um, one thing you said uh, that I really appreciate, and I, I know many attendees on the call are, are caregivers, is uh, the importance of a caregiver uh, break, a caregiver self-care, which you said, you know, reframe it as selfless care, because it, it truly is. And one of the uh, related um, issues that we see uh, both among caregivers and also people with Parkinson's, especially during the uh, pandemic, is uh, social isolation. It seems that we're all locked in our homes. And uh, could you speak a little bit to that? I, I can't imagine that's good for any of us. Their isolation is one of the most dangerous things for the brain. It increases the risk of dementia. Just isolation alone in older adults is one of the number one risks for developing dementia. And so again, you know, how does the social health impact our physical health, right? So we're, it's all tied together. So as much as possible, you want to stay connected. Even when your brain tells you, oh, I'm too tired or, um, you know, I took a walk yesterday outside, you know, you sometimes have to practice what's called opposite action. And so the brain tells you one thing, there's a cognitive behavioral therapy technique that says, do the opposite. <laughs> you know what's good for you, kind of what's your wisdom telling you, don't be isolated, get out. Um, and so sometimes really just practicing opposite action can be very helpful for people. It's kind of a vicious cycle, right? If you get more isolated, you might get more depressed, more apathetic losing meaning and purpose, and then you get more isolated. So it's really hard to break that cycle. Sometimes you just have to practice opposite action and say, you know what, I'm just going to go out. 
And it can be simple things. Maybe you're going to take a walk in the park. You know, and, and you might take a walk with neighbors or with your partner um, and see people in the park or, um, you know, it depends on, you know, everyone has their own kind of meter of, of safety. I have a patient that just goes to a cafe and sits there a few times a week and reads and that's social time, right? Interacting, seeing different things. The brain hates doing the same thing every day and seeing the same thing every day. It's very boring for the brain. <laughs> so it loves variety. It likes to have new conversations, meet new people, see different things. So when you, when you isolate yourself and you just stay in the same space and doing the same things, you're going to, um, you're going to trigger the depression, the apathy, the loss of meaning and purpose, the loss of spiritual health, social health, emotional health. So really isolation is one of the worst things for, for our health as humans. We have to practice opposite action um, to, to tackle it sometimes. And the pandemic, I mean, it's just a hard time. It's a lot of, you know, rock steady boxing is closed for a lot of people. That was their main social outlet. It, you know, I think just also just recognizing it's a hard, it's a hard time. You're not gonna be able to do as much as you would like. Um, but just putting in that effort, using the wellness journal to really schedule two things every week that are social. And it can be just little things. You don't have to like throw a party, right? You can just go to a cafe and sit there outside. Okay, great. Um, another um, thing that you, you, um, uh, you've talked a lot about, I wouldn't say necessarily you emphasize it because you emphasize this, so many things as part of the total health package. But um, in terms of uh, exercise, you talked about Tai Chi, you talked about ballroom dancing, so many things. Um, do you think that uh, there's... Um, is there strong value, for example, I, I posted to the blog or I posted uh, to the chat a list of all of the online virtual Parkinson's exercise classes going on that we know around, around the US any day, any time. There are just so many of them and many of them are free. Is there value in doing that, um, both the person with PD and their care partner together or, um, or do you think it's better for them to do things separated in order to give them each a break from the other? Well, I definitely think that regular respite is, um, has been shown to be the most important uh, thing, you know, treatment that, uh, or preventive measure to, um, to help people avoid caregiver burnout. So regular, regular breaks, whether it's the, your time to work out or your time to go shopping, your time to get a massage or just to kind of stare off into space in a park, whatever, it's, it's important. So if your workout time is your rest of the time, you don't wanna take that away. But I think that otherwise, if it's not the rest of the time, I think that a lot of these classes um, are, are um, you know, really fun actually to take rock steady boxing. There's a great program, PD Connect, um, that is, is a really great program in Marin that has daily online classes uh, that's taught by a really fun physical therapist. And, and so I think that doing, doing those things together uh, is really important. And they usually have like different levels for people. So there's uh, someone doing it standing, there's someone doing it sitting. So you can really choose what level you're doing. Okay, great. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. And I thank you so much, Dr. Katz, for a really interesting presentation. You've given us a lot to think about. And I'm going to post everything onto our webpage, our group's webpage, so everybody can, even people who didn't, uh, weren't able to participate today can share in your, your knowledge and experience. And thank you so much. And good luck with the setting up a Supportive Care Clinic at Stanford. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll have you yeah. back again to talk about that. Oh, that would be great. That would thank be great. you so thank much, you. everyone. Thank you, Dr. Katz. We'll yeah. see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good day.